introduction. Many thanks for, for the invitation as well. So you are wrong. So yeah, it's a pleasure to, uh, sorry, I get many messages. Yes, it's a pleasure to be able to give uh, this lecture online. Um, please uh, do not hesitate to ask questions during the lecture. Uh, I'm able to see the chat, although maybe I don't pay attention. So you can ask your questions in the chat and maybe Hong, you can repeat the questions in case I don't okay. see them. Yeah. Okay, so but you can also just turn on your microphone and ask your questions directly. So don't be shy. This is going to be a, a lecture about Coulomb and risk gases. So uh, as was said, I, I recently uh, wrote a very long review paper, uh, which was dedicated to uh, Freeman Dyson. So it was a special collection of the Journal of Mathematical Physics. Uh, and it's something I wanted to do for many years. And I finally managed to finish this paper. I have to say that it's it's a never ending story. So I keep discovering new uh, new references and new things all the time, but one has to just write it one day and uh, this is what I did. So everything I will tell you during this lecture is in this long review paper, which has more than 500 uh, references. But because I only have three hours, I will concentrate on very specific and act actually a very tiny part of uh, this uh, of uh, this uh, review paper. So if you want to know more, uh, just take a look at the paper and there you will know much more. And in particular, sometimes I will not uh, cite many papers um, in my lecture. All the references are properly uh, written in the, in the paper. Also, sometimes you will see some strange things like lemma 22 or theorem 51. So I've, I have tried to put the exact uh, same numbers uh, as in the paper so that you can find them easy. Okay, very good. So to start this lecture, I would like to uh, put it uh, in a more, in a broader uh, question, which is the question of uh, crystallization. Okay, and there is a very famous uh, problem, which actually is very easy to state. And so I would like to start by recalling or telling you what this conjecture is. And then I will tell you what's known for our particular gases, namely the Ries and Coulomb gases. So what is the crystallization conjecture? Well, it's essentially to understand why uh, water uh, freezes when you uh, put it uh, in the fridge or in the freezer. Rather. Okay, so when you go below uh, zero degrees, Celsius, then you know that water freezes, namely, uh, I mean, it becomes a solid. And this is something which we see and which seems uh, very, very general and seems to occur for many different kinds of systems. And we do not have a very clear mathematical explanation of why this happens. So here is a very vague um, uh, statement of the crystallization conjecture. So it's the fact that infinite classical systems of interacting particles at equilibrium and at low temperature then are periodic. Okay, and of course it's a bit vague. So there has to be some assumptions on the space dimension, which for us is uh, three or maybe one or two uh, for systems which are confined to a line or to a plane. And of course there might be, uh, I mean, there has to be some assumptions on the interaction between the particles. And we will always assume that we have pairwise interactions, meaning that the particles see each other by pairs, so two by two, okay? And then one has to put assumptions on the interaction on the pairwise interaction V. But uh, if you like, the, 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 the main problem is to identify for which assumptions then systems will become periodic. So let me now give a more serious mathematical definition. And I will only discuss the zero temperature case. Okay? So I'm not gonna discuss any temperature and then I would have to take it uh, low enough, small enough. I will just take the exact zero temperature because it's easier. And um, somehow positive temperature is more in the field of uh, probability theory, if you like, and zero temperature is more about uh, calculus of variations, because then in this case, you minimize a certain energy. So what is the energy that you minimize? So you take a domain omega, 
Okay, in RD, I work in any dimension. So I work in RD, you take a domain omega. And then in this domain, you put n points. Okay, and I denote the uh, positions of these points by xj. Okay, so I have n points in omega. And then the energy of my endpoints is the sum over pairs. So it's the same as summing over j three k less than k. So I'm summing over pairs of v of xj minus xk. So here I'm assuming that the interaction is, I'm also assuming that it also depends only on the distance, if you like, between the particles. So I have not written it uh, here, but I will always assume that v is a radial function. So it only depends on the distance. So that's the energy of these n particles, n points in omega. And then what you do is you minimize over the positions of these n points in omega. Okay, so if you minimize, they will be placed in some way. Okay? And for a general omega, you don't expect anything special. In order to see something special, you have to look at a very huge system, a very large system. And so what you do is you take the limit n to infinity. But since you want to get a periodic system, you have to take omega to infinity at the same time. And what you will do is to fix uh, the, the density of points, the average density of points, which is n divided by the volume omega. Okay, so you enlarge omega, you take n to infinity at the same time, and you assume that n divided by the volume converges to some uh, fixed number rho, which uh, is uh, by definition the average density of points. And then what is the conjecture? I mean, under appropriate assumptions on V and the dimension D, the conjecture is that the points should asymptotically be placed on a lattice, okay? So become periodic, if you like. And of course, that depends on where you're looking at the system, okay? So I'm thinking here of an omega, which is centered at the origin, for instance. And then uh, the theorem must be that the points, if I look at finitely many of them, after a while, they will converge to a lattice. However, I could, of course, translate my omega and look much further away. And then I would also see a lattice, but I might see a different lattice, or maybe the same lattice, but uh, rotated or maybe translated. Okay, so the lattice you see might depend on where you look at, but here I just say fix uh, the origin and I look at just one point. So what is a lattice? So let me remind you that there are what's called brave lattices. Okay, so a brave lattice is by definition uh, just uh, I mean, V1Z plus a V2Z plus VDZ, where V1 and, uh, and so on VD is just the basis of RD. Okay, so usual uh, lattice. That's a brave lattice, but uh, I, I'm also calling a lattice when you have a superposition of several such uh, translated copies of lattices, in which case you will have a finite number of points Per unit set. Okay, so the formulas are always nicer when you have a simple Bravais lattice, and uh, very often for me, lattice will always mean Bravais, uh, although in principle you could have more complicated arrangement. Okay, so okay, that's uh, yes. Uh, so sorry, Levin, um, I have a question. So for yes, your formula here, uh, this how for any. Uh, the average uh, den uh, density rho, right? Is this correct? Yeah, so you fix rho, okay? And then what will happen might depend on rho. Okay. Okay, so maybe the lattice you get depends on rho or you don't know, okay? But uh, you have to fix rho, do the limit, and then you expect that you get a lattice, but the L could depend on rho. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay I why I it's just because okay. you see, if. If rho is very large, it means that the points are extremely close to each other. Yeah. And then okay. some other core of V will matter more. Now, if okay. rho is very small, it means the points are allowed. You don't know if they will be far, far away, but they are allowed to be uh, very far away from each other. And then you will see some other, the, the whole of V in a way. Okay. So, I see. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Go ahead. If you have any question, please just stop me. It's very good. Okay, so that's the conjecture in terms of the points. Now, people like to look at a weaker form of the conjecture, which is the conjecture in terms of energy. 
Okay, so what you do is you look at the energy I have defined, so the minimal energy of n points in the domain omega. And then the energy is going to blow up like n, just because if you put them on the lattice, you do the computation, you see how it's going to, do, to behave. And so the conjecture must be that E of n omega divided by n converges to this formula. I mean, if you assume they sit on a brave lattice and you compute, that's exactly what you get. Okay, so the one half is because you've summed over pairs and then you get uh, the sum of uh, all elements of the lattice. You never get zero because J is different from K of uh, V of N. And then there is a third way of uh, formulating the same conjecture, which is to look at now any point in your system and you look at the interaction between this point and all the rest. So you look at this sum here Okay, the sum for j different from j0 of v of uh, xj minus xj0, and this should converge to the sum of v of l again with l different from zero, but now without the one half. Okay, and this you expect, of course, only for the points which are really inside omega. If you start looking at points uh, close to the boundary, then this might be wrong. Okay, and if you are exactly at the boundary, it will definitely be wrong because you know that there will be a kind of half space which is empty. Okay, so this cannot be true close to the boundary. So all this you have to look kind of in the bulk. But if you look at the total energy, then the, the boundary doesn't matter very much. And then you expect for the total average energy to get this formula. Okay, so the, that's the crystallization conjecture. What's known about it? So it's a very important conjecture. It has applications in physics, but not only, also in other sciences like uh, biology or social sciences. Even. It's been studied by many people and sometimes uh, solved, but always in particular situations. And I think it's fair to say that uh, there's no general mathematical mechanism which has been identified so far, which uh, allows us to, to, to know why this is happening. I only explained the conjecture at zero temperature, but there is a similar conjecture at low positive temperature. And you can also look at quantum systems, zero temperature, positive temperature. So there are many uh, extensions. And I think it's one of the most famous conjecture in mathematical physics, but still it's very simple to state if you only look at such classical systems at zero temperature. So there are very famous results. I'm citing only uh, three here, but there are more. So the first one is the sphere packing problem. So the sphere packing problem corresponds to taking V, which is infinite uh, over a ball and then zero outside. So if I go back, so if you like the energy is gonna be zero if the points are far enough from each other, and it's gonna be infinite if the points are too close. So since you are minimizing, it's just saying that you want the points to be uh, far enough, namely at, at least at the distance R, which is uh, the hard core, which you fix from the beginning. So the sphere packing problem has been studied in many, many uh, very famous results. And maybe I should mention the very recent uh, breakthrough results by uh, Marina Wieserowska, who got the Fields Medal last July for, this, for solving these problems in dimensions eight and 24. So there are also results in dimension one, so dimension one is a little bit better understood. And there one uses the fact that on the line, the points are ordered. So it's the same to look at the points or to look at the distances between the points. And one can, one can rewrite the problem in a slightly different way and then solve it in uh, some situations. This was done mainly in the 80s. And then there, are, uh, there is a famous uh, paper by uh, Florian Thiel in dimension two for a very specific class of uh, Lenard-Jones uh, Lenard type potentials. And there are many extensions in the same vein, but uh, even in dimension two, it's not fully understood. So in this lecture, we are going to look at Coulomb and Ries interactions. I see that there is some delay. When I change my slides, I hope that you can follow what I'm saying. So we are going to look at uh, Coulomb and Ries uh, interactions, which is just a very particular class of potential. Yeah, I don't know why it's so slow. So what are uh, Coulomb and Ries uh, 
interaction where it's essentially one over x to the power s. Whom can you see my slides? The new slides. Uh, no, I just no. Uh, saw. Yeah. The... Yeah. Maybe I, I can see that you, you can't see. Yes. Ah, no, now it comes. <laughs> okay. I don't know why it's so slow, but now you see. No, now it doesn't come. Why is it so slow? Very strange. I just see the, the slide with uh, some uh, few famous results. Yeah, slide five. I don't know why it doesn't go to slide six. Slide Sorry. five. Yeah. Ah, oh, boy. Anyway, should I stop sharing and start sharing? Yeah. Why is it working so badly? Uh, Anyway, okay. so now yeah. it now should good. be okay. Yes. yes. Okay. okay, so we look at Coulomb and Ries interaction. So what is it? It's easy. It's just V, which is one over X to the power S for any positive S. Okay. So that's uh, what we call a uh, Ries, Ries interaction. Now I will even allow uh, myself to look at uh, negative S as well as S equal to zero. So for s equal to zero, I'm going to take minus log x. And I will explain later why I take minus log x. And when s is negative, so I still take one over x to the minus s. Now it's a positive uh, power, you see, because s is negative. OK, so it's a potential which diverges. And then I'm going to put a minus sign in front. So I'm changing the sign when s is negative. And I will explain in the next slide, if I can hopefully change my slides, I will explain why I take the log at s equals zero and why I flip the sign for negative s. And you see that I am not going to be able to go below minus two. And this I will also explain. Okay, so it's a family of potentials which depend depends on, on the parameter s, okay? and. Uh, that's what we call uh, Ries. Coulomb is just when S is D minus two, I will also uh, remind you of this in the next slide. Okay. So um, there will be two uh, different situations. The first situation we call the short range is when S is bigger than D. So S strictly larger than D. And that's a much easier situation, although I have to say that there are still many, many open problems in this case too. What is happening when S is bigger than D? Well, V is integrable at infinity, which is good. So it means it decays fast enough, it's integrable. And it blows up quite fast at the origin. It's actually not integrable at the origin, but that's not so bad for us, actually, it's good. So it, it says that the points, they, they don't like to be too close to each other. Okay, so this is something which avoids big clusters, if you like. So they don't like to be too close to each other, and then, they see something reasonable far away. When S is less or equal than D, it's called the long range case. And this is much more complicated. And this includes uh, Coulomb. It's very important for applications. And then in this case, we will have to use some renormalization. Why do we have to renormalize? Well, just if you look at the interaction of one point with respect to all the other points, think that you have an infinite system. I don't know, for instance, a lattice, okay? So put the points on the lattice and look at the interaction between one point and everyone else. Then it is this series here, which let me remind you, now the slides are not changing, it's really crazy. Anyway. So which, uh, let me remind you, is the interaction between one point and uh, everyone else, okay? Then you get this, you get a divergent series. Okay, you have a sum which is divergent because your potential doesn't decay fast enough. Okay, and but this should appear somehow, right? Remember, it was appearing in my previous slide, and so we will have to renormalize this divergent series. Okay, so there will uh, be some renormalization. Renormalization for us will always be based on inserting a uniform background, and this I will explain uh, probably next time, not today. Okay, so why do we look, why do we look at uh, risk potentials? 
Well, because they describe many uh, real life systems and uh, they, they occur in, uh, also in several un unexpected mathemat purely mathematical situations. For instance, they, they, are, they are links with the number theory and uh, in fact with a zeta function. So the Riemann zeta in one dimension and Epstein zeta in higher dimensions. So I will uh, now change uh, the way I'm sharing the slides and see if it gets better. I don't know why it doesn't work. So let me quickly do that. Sorry for the inconvenience. Should be quite quick. I'm gonna use a different software. I hope it works better for you. Okay, so you should see, I mean, it's maybe a little bit less nice, but uh, I hope it works better. So where were we? Here, right? Okay, so this is the risk problem. So now why do we take uh, this potential? So the first important remarks is that I have chosen the signs so that the potential is repulsive. What repulsive means? Well, it means that points, they prefer to be far away. Okay, so if I take two points, then they always prefer to be far away. And so my potential must be decreasing. And so you see that if you want your potential to be decreasing, then when S becomes negative, you have to flip the sign. So that's why I've put a minus to make sure that the points don't like each other too much. Okay, so make sure that they like to be um, further away. Then when S is equal to zero, so if I look at one over X to the S and I take S going to zero, then I, uh, it goes to one for every X, which is not very nice. And so what I do is I do a Taylor expansion in S, and then I keep the first uh, non-trivial term, which is minus log X. Okay, so if you like minus log X, it's the derivative in S at S equal to zero of the previous potential, because if I look at the value of V at S equals zero, I get one. So one is not very interesting. And so the, the, the first interesting term is minus log X. Then why am I stuck at minus two? That's the last thing I have to explain to you. Well, in the long range case, I'm gonna have to renormalize as I explained to you. And renormalization will use the fact that my potential has a positive Fourier transform. Okay. And so I have to remind you of what is the Fourier transform of one over X to the power S. Okay, I take S less than D to have a local integrable function and I can compute the Fourier transform. And if you do the calculation, you will get this crazy formula, which is one over K to the D minus S and this gamma function here in front. And when S becomes negative, you have to take the finite part. Okay, so let's forget this finite part. Anyway, so when S is positive, it is one over K to the D minus S, which I guess you know, it must be this by scaling. And then you have gamma of D minus S, which is always positive. And then in the denominator, you have gamma of S over two. And now what is happening is that at S equals minus two, the, the gamma function here is flipping, is changing sign. Okay, so at every negative integer, the gamma function changes sign. And so I have a problem at S equals minus two because I would like it to have a positive Fourier transform, but I also would like it to be decreasing repulsive. And I, below S, um, below minus two, I can't do both at the same time. Okay, so I had chosen the minus sign to make it decreasing. And I, I also like to have a positive Fourier transform, but then this only works between minus two and zero and then negative, I mean, smaller ACs become a bit crazy. So let me mention that if I allow S equals plus infinity, then that's exactly the hardcore potential which appears for the sphere packing problem. Okay, then I have just because it just becomes infinite when X is less than one and zero when um, X is bigger than one. When S is D minus two, this is what we call the Coulomb potential. Okay, so, that, so what does it mean Coulomb? It means the fundamental solution of the Laplacian. Okay, so 
if I look at some XJs and then I look at the potential which they generate, then they solve this PD. So minus Laplace phi is equal to a constant times the sum of delta. The constant is four pi in dimension three, and then it depends on the dimension. Okay, so we usually call Coulomb uh, the fundamental solution of the Laplacian. I think physicists doesn't like this very much. They would call Coulomb one over x in dimension three. Okay, but for us, Coulomb will always mean s equals d minus two. So notice that in dimension two, that's s equal to zero. As you know, the fundamental solution in dimension two is minus log and the distance. Okay, so the log is very important because it's going to be the Coulomb potential in dimension two. And then in dimension one, it's a negative s is s <laughs> equal to minus one. So namely, you get minus absolute value of a. That's the 1D Coulomb potential. Let me mention that if you take s equals d minus one, then this is just Coulomb in dimension d plus one, of course. And so if you work in dimension d, you can reinterpret this as a Coulomb in dimension d plus one restricted to a plane. So namely, you again have a PDE. So you solve minus Laplace uh, phi tilde, where phi tilde now lives over one dimension more. So instead of working in dimension d, you work in dimension d plus one. You solve this uh, PDE here in dimension d plus one, where you put your points only in a plane, and then you restrict your potential to this plane, and you get the phi. And actually, more generally, any s between d minus two and d uh, also uh, give, gives rise to a potential which sol solves the PDE of that kind with, you see, uh, a certain um, power of x here between the divergent and the, and the gradient. Okay, so that's our uh, risk interaction and an explanation of why we take uh, this uh, convention. What are we gonna do with this uh, potential? So as I told you, I will only discuss zero temperature in these uh, three hours because I think that's enough, okay? And it's only a tiny part of the story, but uh, I think it's okay. So what we will do, we will define and prove the existence of infinite equilibrium configuration. So I do not know how to prove that these are lattices, but I can show that uh, there, there's a concept of an infinite uh, minimizer, if you like, of an infinite energy. And this is what I will define in this lecture. I will reformulate the crystallization conjecture in this setting. And then I will discuss properties depending on S and D, which are finally our unique parameters. There will be no other parameter. As you will see, the row which I had fixed when I explained the crystallization conjecture will disappear and it will play no role. I will start by discussing the long, the short range case, so S bigger than D, which is easier, but still there are many open problems. And then I will turn to the more complicated long range case, which is very difficult. There has been many, many recent works on the long, on long range uh, potentials, but I will spend quite a bit of time on the short range case. And I will only discuss zero temperature, so it's going to be purely variational problems. Okay, two remarks. So I will discuss very much. So my point of view is really to define what it means an infinite equilibrium configuration. And to define this infinite equilibrium configuration, I will use what I told you here in the very beginning. I will use this method of taking an omega, putting a certain number of points, and then taking the limit, which is the classical method in uh, statistical physics, statistical mechanics, it's called a thermodynamic limit. And I have to warn you that this is not the natural way that this problem occurs in applications. Okay, so that's the natural way, easiest way to construct uh, this equilibrium configuration. But then in applications, very often you have several scales in your problem. So what really uh, happens is that you have two scales, a microscopic scale and a macroscopic uh, problem. And then if you look at uh, your system at the macroscopic problem, then you have a kind of continuous distribution. 
which I have depicted uh, here. Okay, and then if you want to know how the points are actually uh, placed, then you have to zoom. So you have to pick a point in the bulk, zoom, and then you start seeing the points uh, at a certain density row, depending on where you zoom. Okay, so in applications, very often, you, it's much more complicated. You have two scales, and in a way, you have to first solve the macroscopic scale before you are able to talk about the microscopic scale. I'm not going to talk very much about this because I will immediately concentrate on the microscopic scale. Okay, but uh, uh, today, uh, before we actually start, I would like to give you many uh, examples and actually even real life applications to explain to you why it's important. There was a question. Question, no. So I'm going to discuss many examples now. Okay, so physical examples. It's going to be essentially only about physics. So, of course, the first, uh, uh, the first and main uh, example is the Coulomb potential. So, the physical Coulomb potential, which is s equals one in dimension three. Okay. And this describes uh, uh, the interaction between charged particles. Okay. And in real life, so this can describe many uh, different physical systems going from uh, some stars uh, to uh, quantum plasmas and also in condensed matter, depending on, on the parameters. So in this picture here, you have the temperature and here you have uh, the log of uh, rho, okay, the density. Okay, so this is telling you that, of course, charge systems, they occur everywhere in our world, and that's exactly S equals one in dimension three. So the model in this case is very often either called either the classical Coulomb gas or the one component plasma or gelium. So it has many different names. And this is what uh, physicists uh, know about it. So I'm now discussing the positive temperature problem, although we are looking at the zero temperature, it's just to tell you what's known. So everything depends on a parameter gamma, which is rho to the S over D divided by the temperature. So for S equals one in dimension three, it's rho one third divided by T, okay? So that's the parameter you have to look at. And for us, when T is zero, gamma is infinite. And the physicists know that if gamma is small, so if you like, if the temperature is large or if the density is small, then your, potential, your system will look like a gas, okay, in three dimension, then it will, if you, slow and if you decrease the temperature or if you increase the, the density it will become a fluid at some time at some point a liquid if you like and then there will be a phase transition and suddenly your uh, system will become a solid namely it will become periodic and it will become periodic with a very specific periodic structure which is the body centered cubic uh, lattice which is where you take points in the cubic lattice and then you add one point in the center of each cube. Okay, so that's one specific lattice and that's the one which should occur here for the classical Coulomb gas. And in particular, if S is one, D is three and the temperature is zero, then it must crystallize in this BCC lattice. That's a conjecture, nobody knows how to prove that. But it's very clear from the numerics uh, obtained by physicists, I mean, a long time ago. So this gas is uh, very important to describe several interesting systems. For instance, it's been uh, confirmed very recently that uh, white dwarfs, uh, so you know the sun, when the sun will collapse, it will uh, become a white dwarf. And then this white dwarf, they, 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 they cool slowly, and then at some point they crystallize. This was uh, predicted uh, uh, essentially 50 years ago, and it was confirmed only uh, three years ago that uh, they actually crystallized. And then the proper model for the, for the stars is uh, the Coulomb gas, which I have discussed, and which we have not yet defined, but uh, which we will define this later. Of course, if you take uh, uh, 
uh, charge particles or so real physical charged particles and you make them live on a plane. So you force them to live on a plane or maybe you can even force them to live on a line. I don't know, by applying some very strong force or something. Then you end up with S equals one in dimension one and two. Okay, so you see that Coulomb is, uh, I mean, the physical Coulomb is S equals one in dimension three, but if you confine your particles to a plane or a line, then you get S equals one in dimension one and two. And I have to tell you that for physicists, when they say Coulomb in two dimension, usually they do not mean the log, usually they mean one over X. Okay, because they think of the true physical Coulomb and then uh, charges restricted to a plane. And then in this case, it's also known that at zero temperature, or known, I mean, predicted that at zero temperature, uh, the system forms a, a solid, uh, which is uh, in a triangular lattice, as you can see here from this picture. Now I have to tell you that S equals three in dimensions one, two, three is also very natural because it describes dipole interactions. So imagine that you take two charges, so a plus and a minus, okay? very close to each other. And then you take two other charges, plus and minus, very, very far apart, okay? When you compute the interaction between these four charges, where you have two groups of, uh, I mean, two neutral systems, you will see that it behaves like a constant divided by the distance to the cube. And so for this reason, S equals three is also very natural in dimension three, but also if you confine them to a plane or a line, in dimensions one and two. And notice that already in dimension two, this is a short range uh, case. Okay, so even short range uh, risk gases are very important. For instance, dipolar gases in 2D are short range. And there they also uh, predict that there should be a, a periodic solution. Of course, the log in 2D, which we call Coulomb, is also very important. That's S equals zero in dimension two. So the log in 2D actually occurs for a specific class of uh, random matrices, the so-called uh, Gini ensemble. I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, the, this also occurs for what's called um, uh, Laughlin wave functions describing the fractional quantum Hall effect. And maybe uh, because of this picture, this um, this occurs when you describe the interaction between vortices in two-dimensional fluids. And there is a very famous work by uh, Etienne Sandier and Sylvia Serfati showing that if you look at the Ginzburg-Landau uh, PDE or the Ginzburg-Landau problem, and, and you, you place yourself in a situation where you have many vortices in your, in your gas, uh, then these vortices, they will actually interact in a certain limit with this potential minus log. Okay, and minus log, uh, so that's what we call the 2D Coulomb gas. It's predicted to also form a periodic lattice, which is triangular. And here is a picture of an experiment where this was actually verified. Okay, so that's S equals zero in 2D. Now, I would also like to talk a bit about short range potential in 2D and 3D. And these are very convenient to describe what's called colloidal particles in charge stabilized suspension. So if you like your glass of milk. Okay, so in this case, I mean, these are very nice systems uh, because you can really just look at them. I mean, you don't need very, very uh, fancy uh, electronic microscope or anything, or you can just take pictures, essentially look at them with a conventional um, microscope, you can take pictures where you actually see that they crystallize when you pass some temperature or when you pass some density. Okay, so these are actually uh, photographs, if you like. Here are pictures of the so-called pair correlation functions where you see again crystallization uh, in a in a triangular lattice. So I have to tell you that these are experimental pictures. So here there, there's no V in a way. We don't know what V is, okay? So we, so what physicists do, so they, they measure experimentally the pair correlation function or they measure experimentally when there are phase transitions. 
And then they ask whether a risk potential short range would be a good way of describing what they observe. Okay, so they would fit the power S. Okay, so they would uh, try to see what is the best S which fits the, the best to the experiment. So there are many works on this problem. So for instance, here is a mixture of um, numerics. Okay, so the, the squares are numerics. So they take the, the risk gas in a 3D with a power S, okay? And N here, the little N is actually S, okay? And they see how it depends on S. And then they do an experiment that's here, this, uh, this triangle. And then they say, ho, oh, oh, ho, it seems say, oh, that S equals uh, 13 uh, gives the best fit to the experiment. Okay, so risk gases are also used as uh, empirical models, if you like, to describe some completely different models like these charged stabilized suspensions. There, there was a question or was, was it just a mistake with the microphone? Uh, okay, you can continue. Yeah. I, can, I can continue, very good. Okay, and so for this reason, they like uh, to uh, compute how the phase diagram depends on S. Okay, and here is a picture of, of uh, the phase diagram depending on S, where you see the BCC lattice, the phase center cubic lattice, the fluid, and so on and so forth. And here is really one, one over S, which is our parameter S, that's for S between five and 10 in dimension three. And they want to know these cases because they want to know if they are good models to describe some system. Now, a very famous, uh, application of uh, Coulomb and risk gases are random matrices. And actually I have to tell you that most of the recent works on these problems are about random matrices. And this is maybe uh, what has uh, I mean, implied a renewed interest in these problems. So I'm gonna be very vague, but if you look at some um, ensembles of uh, matrices. So you take N by N matrices and you pick at random the entries uses, using some law, okay? Then if you choose the law correctly, then this, the eigenvalues of these random matrices can, can uh, follow exactly uh, the law of, of some Coulomb gases. And actually it's usually the log in dimension one or the log in dimension two in some cases. So to give you an example, so if you take normal IID entries in your matrices, then it's the same as putting uh, points on the line, interacting with minus log and in an external potential, which is X squared. And a temperature, which is either one or one half or one fourth, depending on how you, I mean, on some constraints on your matrices, okay? So that's exactly a Coulomb gas, except that it is confined by an external potential X squared. And then what you can also do is to look at unitary matrices, for instance. So you look at all unitary matrices, that's a compact group. And then you can look at the Haar measure, if you like the uniform measure over this compact group. And you pick at random your unitary matrices uniformly in the set of uh, those matrices. And then you get a Coulomb gas also with the log, but living on the circle for the eigenvalues. Of course, the eigenvalues all live on the circle for unitary matrices. Okay, so you take, okay, so you take some random matrices, you compute the eigenvalues, and then the eigenvalues, they are described by some Coulomb gas. So I have to tell you that most people in random matrix theory I mean, they choose uh, the scale in such a way that the spectrum of the matrices will stay bounded almost surely. And it, you, you see very often this shape, what's called the Wigner semicircle law, okay, which gives you some of the, the, the average number of eigenvalues you have uh, per unit volume. Okay, but then you have to zoom. If you wanna see what the eigenvalues are really doing, you have to pick a point and then zoom at that point, and then you will find the Coulomb gas uh, for your eigenvalues uh, at the corresponding density. So this is this two scale procedure that I quickly mentioned. And you might know that when uh, well, the GUE, so the Gaussian unitary ensemble, which is when the temperature is one half, 
then this is believed to be kind of universal. And for instance, uh, it's uh, believed, or there's a famous conjecture, uh, that uh, the zeros of the Riemann zeta function are very well described by this uh, random matrix theory problem. Here is a famous computation by Obisco. Okay, so random matrix theory is all about S equals zero in dimension one. I have to tell you that this is actually an integrable uh, point. So it's an integrable system, S equals zero dimension one. And in 1D, there are three very special integrable points. So there is S equals two, which is an integrable uh, system. Okay, that's a short range problem. It's the Calogero Sutherland model, uh, uh, Moser model, sorry. And there is S equals zero, which is a random matrices, uh, which is often called sine beta, which is actually the same as the Calogero Sutherland quantum model. And then the 1D Coulomb gas is also an integrable system. So these are so in these uh, three situations, one is able to say much more than uh, than for other values of x using the integrability. And then one very last example, which has also generated uh, many many uh, works recently, is that you can use uh, these minimizers to discretize manifolds. And uh, so the specialists specialists are Hardin and Saf. You can read this uh, beautiful paper, which they wrote in the notices of the AMS. So here is an example of, of how the points will, uh, play, will be placed if, uh, depending on the value of S, you see, and you will be able to discretize the torus in a very special way, depending on the S that you choose. So if you want to know more, then read the, the works by Hardin and Saf. Very good. So what's the conclusion of uh, this first uh, section, which was essentially about physics? So as you can see, Coulomb and Riscassis, they appear everywhere all the time for very specific values of S. But if we want to understand this system mathematically, it seems very natural to view S as a continuous parameter in order to interpolate between all these specific examples. Okay, so we want to leave S uh, general look at all s even though for applications maybe only some s some values of s are important it's a very active subject in all sciences it's not an old subject in physics okay so for instance the Wigner crystal so the fact that uh, charged particles uh, can crystallize uh, for electrons this was really observed only very recently namely last year experimentally and this was very fa a very famous paper in Nature. And then from the discussion, it's clear that some values of S are special. So of course, S equals zero is special because this is this log when you go from positive to negative S. S equal D is also special because that's the threshold between uh, short range and long range. And S equals minus two is also special because this is where we are stuck and where we cannot mix uh, repulsive and positive type. Okay, but there might be other values of S which are special. Maybe D minus two is special, who knows? Uh, we don't know. So I have a little bit less than 10 minutes now to actually start the real uh, part or the mathematical part of the lecture after this long physical introduction. So I hope I convinced you that uh, Ries and Coulomb gases are important okay, for applications. And now I will start with uh, the study, the mathematical study of the short range case, which is easier and for which we can say more. Okay, and this will take some time, but I want to be sure that you've understood the easier case for which anyway, there are many open problems too, before we discuss the long range case, which includes Coulomb. So, let me start now with the mathematical part. So as I told you, let me remind you. So we pick a domain omega and we pick n points and we minimize the energy, the energy of these n points when they live in omega. Of course, they, they will actually live in the, in the closure of omega because they want to be as further away as possible. So there will be points on the boundary, okay? 
omega is a bounded set here, maybe a nice bounded set. Okay, we are going to increase omega very soon. And since S is bigger than D, then it's just one over X to the S. And that's the sum of our pairs. And let me remind you that we want to do the thermodynamic limit where we take N to infinity. We take omega grows to cover the whole space and we are going to fix N divided by the volume omega. That's the row which we discussed in the beginning. Now it turns out that because uh, it's an homogeneous potential, then there is some scaling relation. Actually, the energy of n points in omega is the same as lambda to the s, the energy of the same n points in lambda omega. Well, lambda omega is when you dilate omega by a factor lambda. Okay? And therefore, you see, by just picking the right lambda, you can always assume that rho is one. Okay, so because it is one over x to the s, there is a perfect scaling. Okay, this is also why these cases are interesting. So nothing is going to happen when we vary rho at zero temperature, right? Because we can all deduce uh, every rho by just rho equals one by scaling. Okay, so I will tend to keep rho all the time, but you have to remember that uh, the behavior in rho is obvious. Okay, so I can always assume that row is one and then deduce what's happening for any row just by scaling. So the first question, and maybe the only question we will answer today, is to check that the energy really behaves like the number of points. When I make omega grow and I make uh, n grow in a way that the n is proportional to the volume. So that's the first lemma here, this lemma. So let me denote by rho n over the volume. Okay, at this I can always assume it's one if you like. Okay. The lemma says that the energy divided by the volume, okay, I could divide by n instead of divided by the volume. I prefer to divide by the volume now. Okay, so the energy, the minimal energy divided by the volume is of order one. Namely, it is strictly positive and it's bounded by a constant. And then the behavior in rho is obvious by scaling. It's rho to the power one plus s over d. That's what it must be by scaling. Okay, so that's a lemma which tells you, uh, remember we wanna look at the limit e of n divided by n or e of n divided by omega. So the first step is to know that uh, it's actually bounded. And so I'm telling you, that the energy, the minimal energy of n points in a domain divided by the volume is bounded away from zero and also bounded from low. This is gonna be true only for n large enough, okay? But where the large enough only depends on the shape of, on, of omega, not on the volume of omega, okay? So if you take a ball or if you take a cube, then uh, you might, have to take n large enough, not of the same kind, but the, the large enough doesn't depend on the size of the ball. It only depends on the fact that it's a ball. So when I say the shape, I mean uh, the set, which, which is just a dilate of omega and has volume one. So this set little omega, okay? Very good. So it's very important that it's like that because then you can, you can take omega very large and n very large. What's the proof? And then I will conclude the, the lecture of today. The proof is not difficult. So le let's assume rho is one because we know by scaling, we can always assume rho is one. And then you have to show that E of n omega is less than a constant times n. Okay, that's what you have to do. What you do is easy, you just put your points. I mean, it's a variational problem, it's a minimization problem. So you are free to take a trial state and then that will give you an upper bound. So you just put your points on a cubic lattice. Okay? You put the points on the lattice. Of course, you wanna have exactly one point per unit volume. Okay, so if you take a cubic lattice of size one, it might not work exactly. So what you do is you take a slightly smaller lattice. So you take one minus epsilon ZD. Okay, so you take a cubic lattice, which, which is slightly smaller than length one. Then you have more points than necessary. Okay. 
then the number of points in omega will asymptotically behave like one minus epsilon to the minus b times n. So you have a lot of sites, available sites in omega. Okay, many more, many more than necessary. You put your points in any size that you like. Okay. And then, of course, now very easy bound. I look at uh, the sum one over xj minus uh, xk to the s. What I do is for every j, I just take the full sum in k. I sum over all the cubic lattice. S is bigger than D, that's a finite sum. I scale out the one minus epsilon and I get N, that's the sum over J, divided by one minus epsilon to the S, and then the full sum over the full cubic lattice, which is called the Epstein zeta function of the cubic lattice. Okay, and that's the energy per particle we saw in the introduction. We don't expect this to be optimal, but that's the one you get for a cubic lattice. And then I have this one minus epsilon, which is just here to make sure that I can reach density one by putting slightly less points. Of course, in the limit, the epsilon doesn't matter that much, but I have shown an upper bound, which is linear in N as I wanted, okay? And this series is convergent because S is bigger than D. How do you do the lower bound? Well, it's a little bit the same, but of course, lower bounds are more complicated because now you can't come up with a trial state. I mean, you have to study uh, uh, the states that you don't know. So what you do is you, are, you tie space with cubes uh, of uh, side length one plus epsilon. So now you will slightly increase. So they have uh, the diameter of square root D one plus epsilon. And then you call NK the number of points in CK, okay? So you tile your space with cubes, and then uh, you give a name to the number of points in each cube. I call it NK, that's an integer, okay? How many cubes do you have uh, uh, which intersect the big omega? Well, it's gonna be of the order of one plus epsilon minus D times N, okay? Because I'm tiling a, a domain with, uh, with cubes. And then what you do, so you take the, the minimizer, which you don't know, okay, you don't know what it is, but you take it. And what you do is you just discard the interactions between different cubes. So in each cube, there will be some points, okay? And I'm gonna use that the interaction is positive. So it's repulsive. So I can just completely remove the interactions between points in different cubes. But what I do is I keep the interactions within one cube. And then within one cube, I just say that the sum is just the number of pairs uh, divided by the diameter of the cube. That's the lower bound. So I get n, n minus one over two divided by the diameter to the power s. Okay, so I do this for every cube. And then uh, I optimize over nk. I don't know what nk is because I'm looking at the minimizer, but what I do is I optimize over nk Okay, with the constraint, of course, that the sum is n and that I have k cubes. When you optimize, you find exactly this. And then the number of cubes k intersecting omega is like one plus epsilon minus the n. And you see that as soon as epsilon is uh, strictly uh, positive, then the first term beats the second. And you get, again, a linear lower bound in n, okay? with a positive constant for large n. So that's the way you can prove that the energy behaves linearly in n, both as a lower bound with a strictly positive constant and as an upper bound. So on Wednesday, let me just quickly flash the slide. I'm gonna stop now, but on, on Wednesday, I will explain how to uh, prove that the limit actually exists. And then I will discuss what's known about the limit of the energy per unit volume. So thank you very much for your attention.